Is this work? Ah, now it's working. Okay, I'll be gentle then. Uh, hello to everybody. I would just like to say that we are still missing one mem member of uh, our panel, so Danny got lost somewhere. Hopefully, he will join us. Uh, but anyway, we have to start because uh, the time is uh, um, the right to start with. Uh, just to uh, start with our discussions, I would like to say that I'm really, really very honored to, to chair this session about the Internet of Things. Uh, and I would like to ask you um, the PowerPoint presentation, the first slide, uh, if you can put it on, please, the next one. Uh, the next one, on, on my presentation, please, not this one, which is here. The colleague from IT department. <laughs> Just my slides, yeah. We're going to talk about uh, the Internet of Things today, and I'm pretty sure that we are going to have an interesting discussion. Um, but to start with, I would just like to, t to say that... <laughs> still not the right one. <laughs> it's the Internet that's, of some things. Th that's the Internet of some things, yes. Um, the privacy changes rapidly within the information technologies, and um, is this working? A. Eh. Thank you. And I just wanted to share with you two challenges. The first challenge is profiling, which is, from my point of view, and I strongly believe it is true, strongly connected to the Internet of Things as well. Uh, with the development of the digital television, of, uh, with the development of smart video surveillance, we can, of course, profile the individual like we could never before. Uh, for example, today, when the digital television is here, it's not a science fiction anymore, the television is actually watching us and we are not watching television. You have lots of products, and you can find them on the internet, uh, and adver adverts which, which, which are clearly showing that the people who are watching TV, the digital operator on the other side, obviously knows which programs are we watching, and he can uh, focus advertising on um, specific points and specific uh, viewers' behavior. Uh, and you will receive, for example, if you like watching Discovery Channel, and, and, and if you like, for example, watching the shows about cats and dogs, the digital TV operator will presume that you have a dog or a cat and you will receive adverts about cat food, dog food. Um, the picture below there is a picture from uh, the movie called Minority Report. I'm pretty sure that you did see it with Tom Cruise in, as a leading actor. And um, you do remember that when Tom Cruise was passing digital advert boards, that you know those digital advert boards were actually talking to him. Hello, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you like this and these things. You can buy them in this and this shop, and so on. And just a couple of weeks ago, I read an article uh, about the development of those digital advert boards in Japan. They're actually on the market already. Also in Slovenia, which is the country where I come from, some retail companies are buying, for example, smart video surveillance, and this smart video surveillance can actually recognize a person entering the shop, and the, the, the smart video surveillance can say, okay, you are a male, 34 years old, and if we do connect this to the Internet of Things, to the RFID chips, for example, if this person is going to wear Levi's jeans, for example, the video surveillance will definitely recognize, oh, you're wearing Levi's, please come to this shop, we have a fast, special offer for you, and you will receive 10% discount. So it's, you know, data, personal data is on sale, that's what I actually want to say. The next challenge is um, that the argument that we often hear, the argument, I have nothing to hide, is I have nowhere to hide. Today, we have vertical satellite images, we have horizontal street images with low frequency refreshing rates, but what's the future to be? All angles, real-time images, and I am introducing a new service to you, like real-time, you it all, it's copyrighted by me, that's... I invented it just right now. <laughs> and uh, before I give um, a floor to the moderator of today's panel, I would just like to introduce the panelists which are going to share their uh, experience with you, but not in a way that I will introduce them, but I would ask them, I will ask them that they will introduce themselves. So maybe if I start with you, um, please just tell me from your point of view, 
what is the thing that you are mostly proud of regarding the privacy issues that you are dealing with? Well, um, hello everybody. Um, is this on? Should be. Uh, this is, uh, my name is Sagi Lazarov. I'm with the Ernst & Young uh, Privacy Practice. I lead that practice out of the U.S. Um, and the one thing that I'm very proud of uh, being involved with in the privacy world is the development of the generally accepted privacy principles that the AICPA and a, its Canadian uh, counterpart, the CICA, have put together that is a, a set of criteria that is used for both creating uh, developing privacy program as well as uh, auditing them if or assessing them as need be. Thank you. Marisa, what are you mostly proud of regarding privacy issues that you are dealing with? On a daily basis, I presume, yeah? Yes. Uh, my name is Marisa Jimenez. I'm the uh, European um, Public Policy Director for GS1 and EPC Global. And I have to say, I have two things I feel equally proud about. Um, one of them is having the opportunity to put together people that belong to very different worlds to talk and uh, discuss privacy. So technology uh, people, so engineers, lawyers, um, business people, all together to try to find ways in which we can deal with privacy in the area of, of RFID. I'm very proud of that. And the second thing I'm very proud of is uh, the fact that I am coordinating a very challenging exercise, which is the development of a uh, privacy impact assessment framework in Europe for RFID applications. Yeah, we're going Thank to you. talk about it later. Oh, Dan is not lost anymore. Welcome here. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. I'm proud Thank of you. having found the room. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Danny Weitzner. I'm Associate Administrator for Policy at NTIA in the U.S. Commerce Department. Uh, I'd say that, that um, I'm proud of something for which I take essentially no credit. Uh, I'm really proud of the growth of the privacy community globally um, uh, and the fact that um, I look around the room and, and see many people who started working on Internet privacy issues uh, when most people didn't even know what the internet was and that that community has really grown and grown together with the community of, of privacy scholars and regulators and practitioners who've been working on these issues since the 1960s, the 1970s and that, with that, that, that this has all come together into the, the kind of discussion we have here I think is, um, makes me uh, have a sense of great hope that we'll make progress. Okay, thank you. Ian. My name is Ian Kerr, um, and I'm from Canada, and I'm proud, you said you were proud of two things, Marissa, I'm proud of three things. One, I'm proud of being from Canada in the sense that I see it as in uh, the last decade at least, if not longer, really having a leadership role in the development of uh, <coughs> privacy policy, both at the commissioner's level and, and, and in academe in general, and, and I'm very proud of our federal and my provincial privacy office for doing that. Um, I'm proud of a group of colleagues that I work with on a project for four years that's called On the Identity Trail, um, with which if people are interested in, we have a book called Lessons from the Identity Trail, which I'm proud of having a Creative Commons license for, so it's all online. Um, and I guess I'm uh, uh, individually, what I'm most proud of recently is um, some work that I've been doing on a theory that I, uh, of information emanation, uh, which I wrote about in the context of the Snoop Dogg's uh, kinds of cases that are taking place in Canada and having had the opportunity to have my research influence the Supreme Court of Canada in changing its approach to the reasonable expectation of privacy by thinking about things at the granular level that data commissioners think about rather than just through the lens of search and seizure law. Thank you Ian. And David who's going to be our moderator just briefly introduce your, yourself as well please. I'm uh, David Hoffman from Intel. I think the thing I'm most proud of has been uh, being able to play some part of the global professionalization and the practical professionalization of privacy, both in my uh, participation on the International Association of Privacy Professionals Board for many years, uh, but then also at Intel as part of a global company and integrating privacy and security into a, as a fundamental component of how we produce technology and in the way we do business. 
Thank you, and I will just briefly introduce myself as well. My name is Natasha, I'm the Information Commissioner of the Republic of Slovenia, and the thing that I'm really, really very proud of is actually my office. I'm very proud that according to Eurobarometer, which was a survey performed in 2008, Slovenia was the second best country in European Union among 27 European Union member states uh, by the knowledge of data protection in private and in public sector, and nearly everybody who was uh, interviewed knew about the Information Commissioner's Office. So this is what I really am proud of. And when I became the Information Commissioner, I fell in love with data protection. My first love was access to public information. I deal with both in my office. But now, really, my whole life is actually dedicated to those both human rights. Now, David, the floor is all yours. Fantastic. Um, many, I see a lot of familiar faces out there. First, I'd want to thank the organizers. Um, I'm honored to be able to moderate the panel with the esteemed members of this panel. Uh, I'm deeply humbled. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces uh, out, out here in the room. Uh, many of you may know that uh, prior to my career as a lawyer and, and as a uh, privacy officer, uh, I was a uh, struggling and mediocre musician. I said I like to bring my history as a musician back into what I do. Uh, I, I've asked the panel, and I'm going to ask all of you, I, I want us to think about this panel a, as a, a piece of jazz music. And, and so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a theme. I'm going to ask all of the members of the panel to expand and to play on that theme briefly. But then I want to make very clear, you are not the audience. You are all actually musicians yourselves, and I'm expecting that you are going to be signaling me for when you want to solo in this, <laughs> and I will be cueing you, and then I'm expecting that the members up here will play off of your solos, and that we will have a true, in, the kind of interactive dialogue that we should be having when we're actually talking about the Internet of Things. So, so let me transition into that opening theme, which uh, as we kicked this around internally as we were preparing, we wanted to call it an opportunity statement. We want to design this not as talking about what are all of the problems out there, but we want to say what are, what, what are the opportunities that are presented by this panel and also by the Internet of Things and the technology that's being produced. So, so let me go, read this. The evolution of technology and our interaction with it raises substantial benefits. Reduced costs, increased automation, new services, but also keeps challenging the boundaries of individual privacy. Many of these benefits and challenges have been mentioned in the context of the evolution of an Internet of Things, which we take to mean the growing trend of connected devices linking to and communicating with each other. Our panel will call out challenges and benefits from different perspectives, the individual user or subject of the technology, the organizations utilizing technologies that can impact privacy, the broader social impact, and the data protection authorities that oversee and enforce requirements. This panel will provide some specific recommendations for the path forward. Professor Kerr. So um, as you sort of laid out for everybody um, the way we're thinking about the Internet of Things, which I think basically boils down to this idea that our devices are not only connected to each other but can talk to each other and can understand e uh, e each other. Um, uh, I guess when I think about the Internet of Things, one of the things I'm almost always reminded of is Mark Weiser's um, famous line from his very prescient 1991 Scientific American article called The Computer for the 21st Century. And in it he said, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are distinguishable from it. And so when we think about that in the context of the Internet of Things, I think that it's tempting for most people to think about that in terms of hardware and software. We think of things miniaturizing and getting smaller and smaller, and we think of the code being less visible and less transparent, uh, and some of the kinds of challenges that those ultimately raise. I guess I want to think about that in a different kind of way. Uh, another profound uh, means of making technology disappear of weaving it into the fabric of everyday life is in fact achieved by a field that is growing that is called affective computing. The idea of computing that relates to, arises from, or deliberately influences emotion or other affective phenomena. I hope that during the conversation I'll be able to elaborate on some, how, how some of those affective techniques play out in the so-called Internet of Things. Um, 
and in particular because I think that ultimately whatever it is that we're talking about when we talk about the Internet of Things will pose foundational challenges which will provide opportunities but will also raise problems to our foundational notions that, and commitments that we talk about in privacy. For example, the commitment to a knowledge and consent based system. Um, with the increasing robotization of the world around us, I believe that we'll soon start to experience a very jarring shift. Uh, not only uh, a shift in degree, but in fact a shift in kind. Uh, a, a world where consent uh, becomes uh, a serious bug in the code of automation, sort of flipping things around, where we now live in a world where automation is causing some challenges to our consent models, I think we're going to see an actual substantive sea change in that respect. So those are some of the things off the top of my head that, uh, that, I've got, that are on my mind uh, about uh, the Internet of Things. Thank you. Danny. Um, I love Mark Weiser's article, and uh, it's uh, with my uh, former academic hat on. It's a, it was an extraordinary insight, and everyone should read it. Um, I, I want to just pick up on, on one additional thing that he said that's uh, it's a great article because it actually has a fair number of internal near contradictions in it. Uh, one of them is that, as you know, he actually talks about the fact that um, uh, information to be valuable exists at the tacit dimension, kind of like, uh, you know, right along the edge of the walls. Uh, so it's not entirely invisible, but it's almost invisible. And I think that as we think about the design of these, of these systems that include uh, um, uh, huge numbers of sensor inputs and devices that are being tracked, uh, et cetera, et cetera, we've got to think about the fact that, that we've got to think about how to make sure that the, the information that's, rel that's relevant for privacy decisions is is, is there in the tacit dimension, not too distracting so that it, 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 it interferes with the services, but also not totally invisible. Um, I guess the, 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 there are just two things I'd say about uh, the way I hope we can come to think about this, this question of the Internet of Things. First of all, um, if the things are interesting at all, um, they're probably things that are attached to people or have something to do with people in some way. Uh, um, uh, so thinking about these things disembodied probably will, will uh, make us less responsive to the privacy challenges. We really have to think about how they're connected to us in addition to how they're connected to each other. Um, and secondly, um, I think very importantly, these things we all know will have identifiers. We call them an Internet of Things because I think we presume they'll have IP addresses to them, IPv6 addresses if we ever get there. Uh, they'll have some kind of the addressability on the network. Um, but I think more importantly, um, if this environment is going to be successful, these things will also have URLs the way that web pages have addresses. And that what we'll have is really a web of things, not just an internet of things. The value that we're going to get in, in so many of these applications is from, from the web of data that gets created from these things. The, the canonical applications that people talk about, whether it's health monitoring and for environmental monitoring or uh, whatever else it is, is not so much derived from the fact that we have a stream, a, a kind of a one-way stream of data from a thing to some central database that we can use, but, but, but as, as Ian said, that we, we will have um, the integration of data from lots of different devices that we can connect to inf other information on the web. Um, I think of my colleague um, Deborah Estrin's work uh, uh, on uh, environmental monitoring in uh, the Los Angeles, California area where there's very bad pollution. She built some devices with simple off-the-shelf cell phones uh, that allowed people to record their their pathways to work, their commuting routes. Commuting is a pain in the neck in Los Angeles. Uh, so it helps you to figure out what the best way to get to work is. Uh, it also, along the way, records information about air quality, uh, which tells you something about how pollution spreads around uh, Los Angeles. And, and it also helps you to figure out, if you're a jogger, what jogging route to take to get better air quality as you're running. Um, and this is an example of, of integrating all kinds of information, weather information, uh, uh, the, the things th th themselves. Um, so the, the privacy uh, uh, challenges obviously abound. I'll just end with a, another, since we're quoting computer scientists, I'll end with a, a quote from another computer scientist who I've learned a lot from. Uh, ben Schneiderman, professor at um, the University of Maryland uh, and one of the, the founders of the human-computer interaction field, uh, observed 
about uh, successful or unsuccessful uh, user interfaces. He said about he said about interfaces, if you can't see a feature, you won't use it. Uh, and again, I think this is a challenge to the, uh, to the question of whether we expect these devices to completely disappear or just be visible right there at the edge uh, and, and also have the privacy uh, controls and settings and information available right there at the edge so that we can interact with them as we need but not have them get in the way. So, thanks. Thank you, Danny. Marissa. Okay, I'm going to give a, a slight um, different perspective, although I'm going to pick up with uh, some of the examples that, that you mentioned before. I think that the, the Internet of Things is, is a concept that results from the innovative use of converging technologies. So convergence here is, is a key word. And these technologies today are based on identification, location, sensors, and the Internet. Obviously, all of this poses a series of uh, uh, economic and societal challenges. On the one hand side, we have new uh, business models developing, uh, new applications put in the marketplace. But on the other, we uh, are also conf individuals are confronted uh, with uh, enhanced interaction with things in, in, in ways that were unthinkable uh, before. So let me give you some examples of things that are happening today, and I would consider the pre-Internet of Things phase. We have new forms of intelligent transport, energy monitoring, improved supply chains. These are just a few examples that really um, give us a view of, or a tiny fraction of what the Internet of Things um, will be tomorrow. But all of these applications and, uh, that I've mentioned have something in common. And I think it's something that will uh, be common also for the future Internet of Things. And that is the uh, enhanced capability of information exchange about things and by things, hence the uh, Internet of Things. Um, coming back to RFID, which I would put as one of the uh, incipient technologies towards the construction of uh, the Internet of Things. Um, RFID applications that we're seeing today and we will see in the near future are actually a combination of two things. One is the object identification capabilities, also uh, uh, people identification capability, and radio frequency. So again, convergence is uh, key here. Um, the question, uh, looking at all these uh, developments today, is how can we? How are these uh, new applications going to affect the uh, privacy of individuals? Um, are in the individuals' privacy affected differently uh, from today's scenarios? And how can we come up with a framework for privacy and data protection that is efficient, that is operational, and it is appropriate for the protection of, uh, of the individuals while allowing uh, this uh, new incipient and emerging technologies to happen today? So we need a framework that uh, will be future-proof, but that also will support uh, deployment today. Thank you. Marissa, thank you. Sugi. Thank you. And, and to build off uh, Marissa's comment, uh, I, I do want to talk about um, trust and responsibility, especially the role organizations and industries have as we are looking for new ways to, to manage privacy in this, in, in this environment. So we cannot really talk about the evolution of technology without talking about the evolution needed in how organizations handle personal information. Uh, the common approach to privacy puts the responsibility for uh, protecting personal information both in the hands of the organization and in the hands of the individuals the, in the information pertains to. The, the notions of notice, choice, data subject access, um, they, they, uh, these, are these are built on the expectation that the individual actually knows um, where the information is and what's being done with it or what the intent of using it. Um, and that's really not the case with the Internet of Things. The reality is very different. Um, the ability of individuals to make decisions about their personal information are uh, becoming more complicated. Uh, put aside the fact that individuals um, don't read privacy notices and if they try to read them, uh, they find it very complicated. That's not new. Um, what is new, or at least continue to evolve, is the number of organizations that are, in, that are dealing with in the Internet of Things. When, when I'm picking up a handheld device and, and going online for online services, I'm interacting with multiple organizations. There is the, the device manufacturer that uh, put, may have put some features on the device that allows me to control privacy. There is an operating system that was created and is being maintained regularly 
by a different organization. There is a communication provider. Um, there are application providers coming from different companies. Um, and there are advertisers that want my attention and want my information. Uh, with such complexity, we cannot expect individuals to be an active and informed participants in the protection of their privacy. In these situations, organizations have a greater responsibility to be trustworthy. And this is where industry and organizations um, come into play. The evolution of responsibility um, that I'm referring to in the Internet of Things is the need for organizations to step up and build um, privacy requirements and default settings that assume privacy um, in, in their origin and more rigor and control in how personal information is being, uh, is being handled. Rigor and control in understanding, in, in, communic in, in understanding what is being done with information and where does it go when it leaves the, the hands of the organization, what third parties um, receive it and what they do with it. Individuals cannot be expected to be able to maintain an active and informed role in such complex environment. To make the inter Internet of Things work, organizations must step up and take responsibility or else regulators will have to step in. An excellent segue. Natasa. Yeah, being a regulator, I constantly see and notice that it is a fact that the law is always lagging behind the information technologies. And uh, the question is, how can we fill in the gaps which are there on a daily basis? I mean, the minute that we draft a law that, and after enact the law, the industry is hundreds of steps ahead of legal provisions, the regulations. Um, I personally believe that there is a lot of maneuvering space for communication among the industry, among the regulators, and among the legislator as well. Um, I know that the technology is there and there is a famous saying in science that if something is possible, it will be done. It's easy to do that. Um, what are the only stable lighthouses, I, I, I call them, within uh, the Internet of Things, within the data protection uh, as a whole philosophy? I think that the general principles within the legislation, such as uh, uh, data minimization, the proportionality principle, then we have uh, uh, purpose specification, data security, which is, of course, very, very important, accuracy and quality. And I think we have to discuss those things to, to, to uh, better, to assure a better privacy for the individual, because we are all aware that technology is here, it is at hand, it's very seductive, because it's easy to buy, it's easy to develop it. But just to resume, um, a lot of sophisticated gadgets which are enabling intrusion to privacy, they are available on the market. But does that mean that we can use them without the limitations? As a regulator, my answer is clear, no. Thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, we're going to move more to the interactive portion of this. So for those that want to imp uh, improvise from the floor, please just raise your hand. I will continually scan out here. Uh, and we'll, we'll call. I'm going to start with a question, and then I'll come right over here. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I think I heard a lot of common themes here, uh, which is good, because we were playing off of one main theme. But I also may have heard a little discord between our uh, alto and tenor saxophonists over here. And, and, and so I want to, it, it may just be that they're a little bit out of tune and need to work on that a little bit. So I'm going to give them a chance. Uh, it, Ian. Um, you talked a little bit about, uh, uh, and have talked before, about effective computing and how it will render technologies invisible. Um, and, and Danny talked a little bit about, well, if the individual isn't impacted, maybe it's not as big a deal for privacy. Uh, can you talk about how effective computing could render technologies invisible and what you think that means for privacy? And Danny, maybe you could respond to see, maybe I'm just mishearing the complexity in the music. Sure. Um, well, for, for starters, I, if, I, if I might just start by just responding to um, the, the quote that you provided us with and sort of tying the two quotes together, I, I actually don't think of them as discordant. I, think that I, don't, I don't think there's a cacophony there. I think there's a, there's a harmony. Um, and, and that is, um, t to the extent that Weiser was talking about this idea of, uh, you know, the, the profundity uh, attaching to a kind of invisibility. Um, it may well be true that use um, 
is to some extent tied to visibility. We have to be able to see things in order to use them. But the, the question will always be, whose use, right? And there's more than one user. There's, there's the person who possesses the device, if we're talking about the kind of devices that we're thinking about today, um, and, and, and they would certainly need to have certain kinds of visibility to some things. But I think one of the hugest challenges that we all face, and it's been talked about probably in every single panel that we're talking about, is the fact that there's also a backstage. And so uh, there's, there, are, there are lights backstage. It's just that not everybody has access to what's behind the curtain. So, so there are different kinds of uses. Uh, there are different uh, uh, places for visibility and invisibility. And I think that that's part of the challenge. In terms of your question around um, um, examples of affective computing and what I mean by that, um, I guess the idea is that we're now getting pretty good, and, and people in the privacy space certainly know this, at incorporating um, knowledge and, and, and principles from other disciplines uh, into the way that we program and build devices. And so one of the things that people like Roz Picard at MIT have, uh, have, have made a pretty good living on is recognizing that, for example, um, a lot of the devices we use will be used in particular ways and, and those uses can be pushed, if you will, or maybe nudged, um, through the development of emotional ties to those kinds of devices. Um, and, and if you think about it, um, th those kinds of principles are already, this is not something in the future, we're already uh, doing those kind of things from, uh, in Canada we have Emily, which is the voice of Bell, Bell who um, you know, talks to you as your interactive uh, uh, bot or agent, uh, and she talks to you with, in, with certain emotive tones depending on what you've done, or your ATM machine, it doesn't matter what the example is. Some of my uh, own thinking has been about how effective computing is being used in a broader field of robotics, which I think is an important thing to later, to start thinking will come online with the Internet of Things. We certainly have to start with more basic technologies like RFIDs. Um, but as we start to have more sophisticated devices and things, the way that um, uh, those devices will, be, uh, will encourage people to interact and to participate will be through emotive techniques, um, as we're seeing with uh, things like active, interactive avatar bots, like L Girl Buddy was an example from a few years ago, where children who are 12 years old are telling a lot of information to L Girl Buddy about their parents' uh, socioeconomic position, about their body images, about all of these sorts of things. And these are for examples of transactions that are completely consensual um, on any model of consent. Um, it's just that the person uh, doesn't realize that they're not talking to anybody, they're talking to a thing. And in fact, the basis of those transactions are emotive, um, whether it is a robot like L Girl Buddy a software bot, or whether it is something which has got a lot of attention at this conference already, which is Facebook, which might itself be seen uh, through a larger abstraction as a kind of thing on the internet, which there are all sorts of emotive uh, possibilities for why we disclose certain things in certain ways based on design principles. So, so uh, what I hear you saying is that just because something is becoming invisible does not mean that it is not directly engaging with the individual, Danny, which is, I, I think, where you were going, right? right. I, I, absolutely. Um, I, I, I don't think we're out of tune. Um, I, I think, uh, I actually think it's kind of extraordinary to think of this kind of conversation um, and imagine playing it back uh, to... Uh, 15 or so years ago when um, early web design was happening and I can tell you as a matter of fact this kind of conversation wasn't happening when 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 we were figuring out how the web was was being put together um, the web did had some I think some important social insight in it but it was social insight about how people could share information easily there was in all candor not enough insight about how to manage the complexity of people's personal relationships. So, so the kind of work that's going on in, in effective computing, social computing, uh, uh, so the sort of reintegration of a lot of the more sophisticated uh, design thinking uh, uh, into these new services, hopefully into whatever this complex of things called the Internet of Things is going to be. Once there are a couple of applications, we'll say, oh yeah, that's the Internet of Things. I think we're uh, 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 still still have a little ways to go there. But, but I think, um, you know, I think there's, there's tremendous possibility here and 
from, from my perspective, the, the public policy question is, how do we encourage this kind of thinking to continue to happen and actually take hold? What we do know about the web, uh, what we know about the internet, what we know about most uh, kind of mass adopted technologies is that um, uh, there's relatively low inertia, low barrier to creative design thinking early on. Um, there's very high inertia and high barrier uh, to creative design thinking later on. And I think that a lot, and this is, this is what the, the people who preach privacy by design, I think, are, are, are picking up on. Um, I sometimes become concerned that privacy by design is in some quarters becoming synonymous for design by license, and I think that would be an unfortunate development that would really push out a lot of the kind of creative, innovative thinking, innovative design thinking, and turn it into a question of regulatory compliance and legal compliance. I don't think anyone wants that kind of result. Um, but I do think we nevertheless have to have to make sure that we we have in mind a set of of of, of soft and maybe sometimes hard incentives uh, 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 to make sure that that as we're putting these new systems together, we're incorporating the kind of thinking that that, that Ian is talking about. Thanks, D Danny. Uh, you know, so often the case in, in jazz, mu uh, jazz music, the trombone section has to wait for the saxophones <laughs> to leave the stage before they can take. And I, I know a member of the trombone section wanted to uh, improvise. So do you want to rise and uh, give us your question or your comment? I, I think there's going to be a handheld mic right behind you. I'm John Borking from the Netherlands. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting discussion, but I'm wondering whether the, um, it starts to become the tale of the apprentice or, or the, the sorcerer's apprentice. That's something that things are going out of control. I, I'm uh, involved in uh, research on the adoption of privacy by design and, and, and privacy enhanced technologies. And what we discover is that um, we approach privacy from the organization's point of view, just not from the individual. What we discover is that the maturity of uh, the organizations is rather low, even to um, apply or to understand what privacy by design means. And so it seems almost that the legislation sets uh, too high standard for the majority of the organizations that have a low maturity on, for example, IT applications. And we did it, uh, uh, our yardstick was especially the identity and access management tools. And if you, you, you there are well-known maturity classes uh, from initial to uh, very advanced. Um, and if you look where companies are, they are mostly on a much lower level than even the middle. And we think that privacy by design starts to become of interest when you are somewhere in the middle of the maturity and you are nowhere. And on the other hand, you see an enormous development of the Internet of Things. And now I, I, I fear that on one hand, the, these kind of tools are entering into our market, and on the other hand, companies will, organizations will not be, be able to protect our privacy because the maturity is not there. So what will happen? Will the stop it is more or less what you said also, or Mr. Weiser? Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. I, I, I will let you know I actually was a trombone player, so that was a compliment that I was giving you, and I enjoyed the, the intervention. Um, uh, Marissa, you are deeply involved in working with industry to try to bring together thinking on this issue, and I, I think that's the heart of John's question, is to say how ready is industry to design in by privacy by design the right kind of controls into this kind of environment. Can you give us a sense of where we're at? Okay, I can give you a sense of what I know <laughs> because the industry, when we, again, um, th there are many different applications in this, in this area, but um, I think I, 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 have to, uh, I have to agree with, with the commandant. And the fact is that w we sometimes um, think of, of privacy protection in terms of we have on the one hand side the users and individuals and the other side the industry as if the industry was something homogeneous where all companies would be of the same size, have the same uh, knowledge uh, about privacy, had privacy offices, and this is not true. Um, one of the most exciting things about these uh, new technologies in the pre-internet of things area is that they're made available 
to everyone, to all types of companies, small and big, and that small companies can do, uh, for example, uh, enhance the, the efficiency of their supply chains in partnership with very other big companies. So it's uh, the, uh, in collaboration. So it, it has been, a, in some way, in the area of RFID, a challenge to bring everyone together. And we have, even before talking about privacy by design as something that is technical or technological, uh, we have started by, by uh, informing, guiding um, uh, for RFID operators about privacy, about what it means, uh, and, and what type of controls they need to have in place. And we continue to do so. In fact, on, on our work on the, on the privacy impact assessment uh, framework that we will talk perhaps later on, this has been one of the major missions here, is how to give guidance to uh, companies, whether big or small, on what privacy means and what data protection means. And in also bringing here a little bit of the concept of uh, consumer confidence. So in, the, in, this, in this world where new technologies um, enhance the capability of interaction of individuals with things, I think that the, the concept of, of privacy and data protection is enriched by uh, a, a in, 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 is enriched by consumer trust and consumer confidence principles in addition to the classical uh, data protection principles which are ve still very much valid. Sagi, can you add to that? Yeah, I want to add on that and I, I think the GS1 mm -hmm. example with the RFIDs and the development of a framework is, 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 is a great example of where things should be. Um, the responsibility that industry groups should be taking um, to create some standards that then can be built into the, uh, the privacy by design approach that those, the organizations, member organizations uh, will, be, will be taking. I think that there is also a responsibility on the side of the regulators to understand what are the different industry organizations out there and what are the different tools, standards, assessment, all of those terms, what do they mean um, from in different industries and ask for it. We've seen good examples of regulations and regulators that are becoming more specific and reaching out to industry and, say, and, and making reference, whether it's the, uh, whether we're talking about breach notification requirements in the U.S. where um, when the HHS released its um, Health and Human Services Department in the U.S., when they released um, their requirements for breach over protected health information, they actually cited very specifically what NIST standard, standard they are referring to when they say that that's sufficient encryption where if that information is lost, um, notification is not necessary. So they're making reference, they're, they're aware of industry organization and making reference to their um, standard. Um, uh, Commissioner Kavokian uh, in Toronto in 2007 uh, required the Toronto Transit Commission to follow an audit under the generally accepted privacy principle, again, being specific about what industry has to offer and being able to, um, to apply that. Thank you, Sugi. Um, Arissa, I've got three folks from the audience lined up, um, Joe, Deirdre, and then Scott. Let's start with the steady rhythm line of the bass player, Joe Aladef. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess I was going to, to use the jazz term, riff a little off uh, Danny's <laughs> comments. And I was going to trail back to experience I had when I was in college, which is I was a jazz DJ, since I can't play any instrument to save my life. But the concept there was you used different records and you blended the sounds together in between the records. And the reason I'm saying that is when Danny made the comment about the internet addresses and the web addresses, I remember back two and a half years ago at the Nice meeting, there was a reference to the fact that every Coke can will have an internet address and that every Coke can will be speaking directly to the internet. And the concept is the first person in business who makes that suggestion is the first person to get fired. Because there is no conceivable benefit or use to that. That doesn't mean the Coke can won't have a tag on it. And that doesn't mean the Coke can won't interact with the Coke machine. And the Coke machine may be speaking to the internet to say, replenish my inventory, I don't have enough Coke left in the Coke machine. Or the Coke, mach the Coke can may be interacting with the, uh, the, uh, the systems that are used to dispose of garbage because it'll say this can is made out of completely recyclable material and therefore that system will be able to read the can and decide what to do with it. But the idea that every object that has a tag on it is going to be speaking directly to the internet is a misconception. They will be speaking through other devices, local area networks, and so I think that's where Danny was talking about interpreted through the canonical applications. 
because it's not that each of these devices will be connected. And when you start thinking of regulatory paradigms and potential harms, it's important to note that a lot of these area networks are going to be human mediated. So a smart home is going to have a dashboard and you're going to be able to control how your objects interact with the rest of the world. It's not your objects themselves. That doesn't mean that you don't have to think about the fact that an object with a tag and you walking around with it may be observable and may be readable and some information may be accessible. And you have to take certain precautions related to that. But you, you, you have to be able to paint a realistic picture of the world, not say, just because this could conceivably happen, it's something that the regulation should deal with. If it's likely to happen, if it's happening, these are things you have to think about. Just because something is technically feasible should not make it the basis of a regulation. Reactions from the panel? Anyone? Can I just briefly say something? There was one really, really important remark that Peter Hastings uh, uh, said at the plenary session just an uh, hour and a half ago. He said that privacy rights are not only the rights of the individuals, but we all have to be aware that it should become a social norm, that privacy, privacy is a social value. Sometimes I do have an impression that the people who are uh, developing IT technologies are forgetting ab about privacy, that those guys are actually the people who have nothing to hide, who don't think about privacy as a social value. So I think that we all have to think that even the people who developed IT systems are at the end individuals who can and will be traced if we are not cautious about what technology is offering to invade the people's privacy. Yeah, so just, oh, what, sorry, just one quick comment, uh, maybe to relate what uh, Joe said to Natasha. Um, I, I think that w what I take from your comment, Joe, is that the the um, the network environment, if, if you will, of this Internet of Things is going to be a whole lot more complicated than to just say there are some things down there and they all connect to some database up there, and therefore we have a we can apply a kind of a pretty traditional, you know, uh, sort of database regulation model and just make sure that the 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 data is collected properly and processed appropriately and then it's all fine. Uh, and I don't think you're saying that at all. I think, I think what you're really pointing out is, in, in all fairness, the, 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 the weakness in some cases of narrow engineering thinking, which is that all we have to do is make sure that the, 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 the devices uh, can interact properly with each other and then we've solved the problem. Uh, that's, that's why people think of the idea of, the, of all the Coke cans communicating, because you think, well, we can make Coke cans communicate, so let's try it. Um, uh, it ends up that that, while it might be an interesting engineering problem, it, as Joe points out, it has no business rationale and probably creates a whole lot of privacy problems along with it. Um, but but, but, but I, I, I'd come back to my point that I think, just even from observing my former students at, at, at MIT, um, uh, the the sense of what constitutes good design, I think, really is evolving uh, to take into account uh, a more a more holistic view. The kind of the kind of work that Sagi is talking about with organizations having to take responsibility. The the fact of the matter is, and this is you know the, an important marketplace phenomenon here that I think we should all have in mind, is that um, uh, my experience is that that. Um, engineering companies, companies that build things, companies that offer products and services are actually now trying to hire people who can take a more holistic view of privacy questions. You guys, I know, I'm sure have to hire people to, to answer these questions. And that's a great thing. That means that, that students Students want to take my classes now, which is really nice. <laughs> uh, so let's. They want to take Deirdre Mulligan's classes, you know. Um, and I, I think I think that we have to look at this as as a kind of a long term evolution of, of of the whole field, the whole design uh, arena. So Ian Sigi, and then to Professor Mulligan, because I've got about five other folks in line too. So let's. Uh, sure. Well, well, picking up on that point, and then going back and responding to Joe at the, at the same time. I think it's interesting and important to think about the things that aren't going to be part of the Internet of Things or that are sort of silly to ponder in terms of some of these questions. But at the same time, I think it's very important to stretch the imagination and try and articulate the possibilities around what things might be connected. So I agree with Joe that not every Coke can is going to have a URL. 
but I'm thinking that probably every pair of cochlear implants is going to have something like a URL. Um, and it's interesting then to start thinking about, for example, with those kinds of devices, what are the kinds of legal and business models that we're going to use? Are we going to use our current models, which is currently the case with cochlear implants? So I have uh, been doing some work that I call the components of health. And I'm not talking about things like water, good job, uh, not smoking, things like that. I'm talking about components like, uh, like cochlear implants. And uh, in this context, if you look, for example, at the main uh, North American provider of cochlear implants, a company called Advanced Bionics, they have a terms of service that comes with their product, which is modeled on mass market consumer goods. So one of the terms uh, in the ears that you have now had a very serious surgical uh, operation so that you're, you're, you no longer have an auditory nerve uh, that functions, you've circumvented it with the cochlear implant, so there's no going back. So now you have this device implanted in you, and one of the terms of service that you will have to agree to is that if you were to use other devices to connect to that device that weren't authorized um, by that company, all the warranties will be void. Wow. Yeah, and that's absolutely true. So I think it's really important to start thinking about the way in which these things are going to be connected and whether we're going to use the same business models or we're going to recognize that we need business, different business models. And I was hinting before at the, 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 the robotization question and, and talking about consent being a bug in automation. Uh, going back to, the, to this principle about um, are our current uh, fair information practices too hard for companies um, uh, to put into place and do we ha you know, what are we going to do about that? I think the, the actual question is, are these the right principles anymore? Because how, for example, do you do knowledge and consent where the entire impetus of the Internet of Things is automation, i.e. to remove any of the human interaction that was previously part uh, of a transaction and the whole point is to delegate. I think it's really important, and I want to make sure we get a lot of people intervening. I want to come back to what would privacy by design mean in this context in a little bit. Um, Sigi, did you want to make yeah, a quick I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, so going back to the example of the appliances, talking to, um, to other appliances, talking to other companies, and uh, I, I want to ground that with, with the notion that, yes, we, we might have, because of privacy by design, the option to... Um, decide how much information is shared by our different devices. But the question is, and I think that we, we should ask ourselves based on recent experience, what is fair to expect of individuals to, to deal with if there's consents and options to choose from at home and, and the store after we buy something. And, um, and, and, and that brings up the notion of default settings and what they should be. How should we set it up just because we know that often people do not go in and, and make those choices. So. Um, beyond privacy by design that gives us the option of actually um, giving um, different consent options, the, the other question is how do, we, how do we present a product or a service initially um, to the users so that there's a higher likelihood that they, their privacy would be respected. An excellent point. Professor Mulligan. Yeah, I, Ian gave the perfect setup. It was good before, but it was even better at this question of how do you deal with notice and consent, right? And you raised, so you have an embedded device, and most of these devices are tiny. They have very limited onboard computing capacity. They have no screen, right? There's no mechanism. And if you look, you know, both of you have mentioned human-computer interaction research, research on ubiquitous computing, collaborative workspace computing. They don't talk about notice and consent. Right, because those are this, it's this binary fixed something that happens at one point and governs every activity after it. Right, they talk about feedback and control and going to kind of Danny's point about tacit knowledge. And I think one of the most important insights about that feedback and control is it deals with this issue of collapsing, um, of crossing context, right? We've heard a lot about collapsing context in the context of social networks, but here we have, we have a device that typically is going to be carried around or it's portable, much more so even than our laptop or our handheld. And as it crosses context, what you might consent to, right, changes dramatically. And so anything that has this fixed notion to it, which most of our kind of legal compliance models do, seems completely in opposite to the experience of these devices in the wild. And so I think thinking and learning from these more uh, socially oriented approaches to thinking about how people interact with technology is an incredibly beneficial thing. So I wanted to add that to the riff. Uh, we're going to want to go here, 
here, here, here, here. So um, it's, got, it's got first uh, right here, and then we'll come back. Do you want to hand the mic on down? I'm going to keep, a, keep them in order that I see them. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Scott. Thank you very much. Um, just use it. Don't, don't turn it. Um, so I, I guess my, my, my question is, is sort of a fundamental question. You know, this, this topic is about um, the, the Internet of Things, but this, this, uh, th this conference is about uh, privacy and data protection rights. And so my question is really how do we link the two together? And we talked about lots of different things that could be uh, uh, Internet enabled. I think we all know that the definition of, of personal information under, under an uh, EU regime, which is you know, information about an identified or identifiable person. So my question really comes, you know, at where do we draw the line? When is a cigar just a cigar? So I guess I'd like to hear from um, the, uh, 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 Natasha, the uh, Data uh, Protection Commissioner, about where, what some of the key factors you look at in drawing that line. So, Natasha, I'd also like to, I mean, we've had a lot of work on the definition of personal data. And the Article 29 Working Party put out what I think is a, a, an excellent examination of the issue, and there's been a lot of conversation about that. What does that mean for the Internet of Things? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> it's very hard. But the definition we have right now in the European Union Directive on, on personal data protection, I think it's useful and it still is valuable for, for the data protection community. Like personal data is everything which is connected to an individual, an individual is identifiable or identified person. Uh, and uh, being a lawyer, I mean, and talking to my lawyers in my, in, in, in my office, can we invent another definition? We would need years and years, and the minute that we would write another definition, the information technologies will go ahead again and will be old-fashioned again. So it's... Uh, <laughs> but within the Internet of Things, we must not forget one thing. They are not things that they are communicating to each other. Those things belong to the people, to the individuals. And those datas which are, which are somewhere stored in data warehouses belong to somebody, to a certain data controller. And I strongly believe that there is always somebody who controls the data despite the fact that we are talking about the Internet of Things. And we have to be aware that the data controller has a lot of obligations to follow um, reading data protection laws all around the world. It's not just European Union. Um, but to answer your question, how to change a definition of a personal data, I'm not knowledgeable enough to do that, I, I admit. Let, let me add one thing and, and then we'll go to our, our next question. No, it's not clear to me that we have to. Uh, you know, the, the definition right now, uh, as I believe that, it's, it's, that something is likely reasonably to relate to an identifiable individual, that provides a lot of control for the people who are setting up the systems to take steps to make certain that it's not likely reasonably to relate to an identifiable individual. The standard is not whether it is at ever possible to relate to an identifiable individual. So I, I think this becomes an important component of what privacy by design means and what obligations you want to connect um, to the fact of whether it becomes personal data or not and whether you want to take that on when you're designing the, designing the system. Let's go here. Can, can I just here. quickly say, oh. David, I'm sorry to, sorry to interrupt. Uh, um, you know, I, I, think, I think that it's, um, I think you're right to observe the difficulty of, of, of altering uh, uh, this critical anchor point in the, in the data protection framework. Um, I think it's also the case that the, the, the definition has got so much attention because it's, it serves to scope, of course, the entire discussion. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I, I hear that and I think about um, uh, Deirdre Mulligan's suggestion, uh, sort of a model of feedback and control, um, which, which is uh, a, a much more general mechanism, interestingly, in many ways. Uh, I mean, it's a mechanism that we see all over information technology, all over the web, all over, all over the devices that we have, um, uh, that, that gets applied uh, when it seems useful, not so much because there's a legal requirement to apply it. And it seems to me that our, our challenge is to, is to uh, somehow 
encourage that kind of, of flexibility because it clearly helps as a general design pattern to, to, uh, to empower uh, individual data subjects, whether or not the individual interaction necessarily meets the strict definition of personal information or not. Um, uh, uh, but by the same token, if we have a definition that's too broad, and I really do think in this Internet of Things area we risk an, an absolutely overbroad uh, uh, definition and, 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 and application of data protection principles, uh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to end up in a, a set of disputes as opposed to a set of, of, of kind of constructive uh, uh, design advances. And that, and, and that really seems to be our, 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 our challenge. So Sorry. I want to no, I I go here um, because I want to go in the order that we've gone. Um, I, we're going to want to come back in a little bit to make sure that we talk about some of the discussions that are going on within the Commission and the EU Experts Group. Marissa sits on it and Marissa can inform, uh, inform us of where we are. But I, I do want to make sure there's a bunch of people waiting to intervene, some who have not intervened yet. Go, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Wojciech Wibirowski. I'm a Data Protection Commissioner from Poland. And it's exactly the right time to ask the question that I wanted to ask. Uh, I would like to uh, half year ago about RFID. But actually, it's more or less like we would like to communicate to you that we don't have anything to communicate. And maybe you will tell us uh, what, do you mean, what, what do you think about the subject. And we are quite close to the uh, moment when the countries should provide the Commission with the information what they do with the RFID. It's just May next year. And uh, being from the country, which is at the same time quite a big country of the European Union, and on the other hand, it's not really known to be very developed. I can say that my country uh, don't have an answer to the question from the Commission. So what do you expect? Do you expect the real role of the European Union in changing the uh, environment we have? Uh, or you rather would like to, them to refrain from doing anything? And uh, maybe the other, the other question, and more, more uh, technical and uh, uh, addressed to everybody is, uh, should it be the part of the discussion that is right now starting about the changes in the directive, or we are not ready for it, and we should leave it for the discussion in the future? I think that was for me. <laughs> um, uh, it's, a, it's a very important question. Um, uh, uh, all, all, I obviously can't say what we expect to happen uh, uh, in the, the in the commission. That's for that's for the commission to uh, figure out with all of your help. Um, what what we certainly uh, uh, what 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 we certainly hope will happen, and and the the uh, key intent of of um, of Larry Strickling's speech, my boss's speech this morning, was to suggest that in these forward-looking questions about, about data protection in the information society overall, of which this is one, but not the only one, uh, we look forward to a renewed dialogue. From my own personal perspective, I think regardless of what side of the ocean one sits on, we all face a common set of questions. Uh, um, uh, the, the question about the, the definition of personal information, the question about how to address these these the, these emerging environments such as the Internet of Things. Um, to me, what's most important is that we we take the next step uh, together as much as possible. Um, I don't believe we'll take exactly the same step because uh, no two countries, no two regions can can figure out how to walk perfectly uh, uh, together. Nor should we. Um, but, but I do think that uh, uh, a decade or so after the safe harbor discussion, uh, we have a new set of challenges that we really face collectively, and, and our hope is to be able to meet them together, uh, uh, in some part because I think that's important for uh, um, individuals to have a consistent experience of, 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 of privacy rights around the world as they travel around the Internet, and in some part because um, uh, uh, we think that the development of a, of a more interoperable uh, global internet environment is really critical for the health of all of our economies around the world. And I, I want to just make, make one footnote on the notion of what we mean at least, what we hope for in, in the realm of interoperability. I don't think we come with the expectation of a, of a grand top-down 
convergence. Uh, I think that we recognize we come from different legal traditions. We, we have many common values, but express them differently, implement them differently, operationalize them differently. And I think we have to start with the realization that, that, that we do that, but that we have a lot that we can do together uh, in creating a more, a more consistent uh, uh, environment uh, to operate in. Thanks, Danny. Uh, question back here. Uh, hi. Um, is that working? Yeah, Chris Doxey from the Office of the European Data Protection Supervisor. I'm not sure the mic is working. Not working? There oh, we go. Speak yeah. loudly. Okay. From the, um, I think it's time to emphasize um, the role of folk music in this debate. We've, <laughs> we've talked a lot about jazz. Could you stand up? Because your microphone is on and off. Will standing help? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I, I think what folk music has to offer is that it takes old valued themes and it refreshes them with each generation, and it makes them new. And we do have, uh, as, as tools in this debate, old value themes. You call them lighthouses, Madam Chair. We've got principles of data quality. We've got principles of uh, uh, legitimate processing. Uh, but um, we need to update that to this new generation, where you have a, um, this situation, which I've learned this couple of days, of a multiple uh, host of data controllers, you know, it's not just the phone, it's not just the app, it's not just the ad company. And how do you, how do you get, how do you help those processes conform with the legal requirements of whatever jurisdiction? Um, just as a side point, because I notice people are a bit worried about the effect of law on, on innovation, I think Peter Husting stressed today that there's room for self-regulation in this debate. And in terms of saying what is in conformity with legal requirements and state of the art. There, I think there's a lot for industry to do in getting a, a agreements on what should be appropriate in each given sector. But the point I want to make, getting back to the folk music theme, is that there is, a, there is another old principle, another old theme, that's there in the OECD, OECD guidelines, which I think has an important role for us in this new generation. And that's the principle of accountability. It was there in the Article 29 opinion. It's very well discussed. And what it gives, and I think this is really useful when there are so many processes involved, it says to each processor, you must work out up, up front what you have to do to be in conformity with the rules. And then you have to be transparent about it. We mentioned audits and so on. But I would just suggest to the panel that this is the way forward, this old theme which has the new life. Uh, your, your comments are, are well received and I, I think there's many ways to see privacy by design as a component uh, of accountability. Marissa, could you comment maybe on the way that those themes, and then we're going to go up front, uh, the way those themes are being explored in the EU experts group that you're sitting on that's looking at these issues? Yes, and also in a way would uh, answer you, your, your question too. And I, I have to say I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying because we, we have been um, working with the Commission and also telling them that we all need to be, do a better job of informing what's happening, at least in the area of, of RFID and privacy, to member states and to data protection authorities as well. Um, the, just, it, it might be a little bit long, but I think it, it needs a little bit of an explanation so everyone is on the same page and we, where we stand on, on uh, RFID technology and privacy. The, the, the discussion uh, on RFID and privacy um, started to be very, very intense in the European Union in the year 2006. Uh, there were uh, about uh, two or three years, two years and a half of intensive consultation. It was a very transparent process where industry and stakeholders could participate, and not only from Europe, but also uh, from other parts of the world. Um, as the, in, in addition to this, uh, the European Commission decided to create an experts group on RFID, including all types of stakeholders, so consumer groups, uh, privacy groups, standards organizations, and different types of, of companies, um, as, well as, other, uh, mem and as well as some member states. During those two years of work, we debated and debated and debated about how to deal with this issue from very different angles, and the Commission decided um, on, on the advice of the, uh, by the advice of the experts group to uh, issue a recommendation. And a recommendation, for those that don't know, it's a non-binding document. So it's not law. 
What this means is that in principle it is not enforceable. But it, it, it was very innovative because for the first time in a long time in these discussions, the European Commission said we are going to give um, some, uh, some guidance to member states and some guidance to operators of RFID um, about what you need to do in order to put forward privacy-friendly applications from the outset. So in a way, I already think that the recommendation is an example of privacy by design by the regulator, by the way. The problem is that the recommendation, which is based on very simple principles, but very important ones that are not that are the principle of transparency, the principle of choice, they just use different words. So in some, sometimes we believe that we're very far apart. We're not. It's just that we call things differently. So information, transparency, notice, uh, choice, consent, user control. So we're not. So, so it was based on those principles, but there was an innovative element there. And that was, rather than determining whether RFID technology is good or is bad for privacy, it will be for each operator to screen their application and determine whether it is done in accordance with privacy and data protection individuals or not. So in order to do this screening, uh, there, we looked, the Commission looked at other parts of the world, Australia, New Zealand, also some parts in, in Europe, the UK, Finland, the United States, and they said, well, privacy impact assessment might be the, the solution. But the problem was that in Europe, there isn't one way of doing privacy impact assessments. There isn't a culture to do that. That is why it said in the recommendation, industry in collaboration with stakeholders have the opportunity to come up with a European PIA framework for all RFID applications. So it gives a hand to self-regulation and collaboration with stakeholders. Nevertheless, whatever we do needs to be endorsed by you, by the Article 29. Um, and this is where we stand today. Um, the the uh, Privacy Impact Assessment Framework um, has, uh, has been initiated, it was initiated a year and a half ago under the auspices of the experts group. The, there was a new experts group created just for uh, the developing of the recommendation. And we've been working on that with other stakeholders. Now, industry um, uh, from many different angles, so uh, from uh, retailers, logistics providers, technology providers from Europe, but also from other parts of the world, have gotten together to do this work. Um, and we, we hope to be able to, uh, to, to, to show you something very soon. So the problem is that, yes, uh, the, the recommendation is an instrument that is addressed to the member states, well, that's what the treaty says, but in a sense, what the recommendation is, is a, a piece of work addressed to operators, to industry. And there are many pieces in that recommendation that still need to be done, and that haven't been yet done, but we are on our way. So I do see what, what, your, uh, what your issues are. Nevertheless, when I think that one, one important thing for member states to understand if we all want this recommendation to be valid and be implemented, and I think it got consensus, it got really good reviews from the consumer groups in Europe, very good reviews from the industry, so we all agree that this recommendation is the way to go, is that there needs to be more awareness about this recommendation in member states, and I think that would be a point for uh, member states to follow up. Thank you, Marissa. Can I, I, we're can gonna, I, sorry, can I just add something, just briefly? Okay. It is very important. You are aware that the Working Party 29 all, already answered, and, and the, the Working Party, yeah, you're working on it already. And I think it's very important to see this process, because from the Data Protection Authority's point of view, believe me, we are not in a position, and we do not wish more powers to regulate uh, all of the IT development which is actually going on in the world, it will mean more bureaucracy. For, for example, me personally, I am really very interested in communication with the industry. I'm interested in self-regulatory frameworks, which can be really, really very useful with no bureaucracy uh, from the regulative uh, bodies. But if this is not going to succeed, then the regulator will have to step in. But we have to give a chance to you, to, to the European Commission, to the, to the industry, to develop s s some kind of code of conduct. 
just to, to yeah, and, and I think that privacy by design and privacy impact assessment are the right tools to start with. So we've got in the front row, then two rows behind, and then Mr. Borky. So those two interventions should have gotten those, those solos should have gotten an applause. You know how you applaud after the solo, the jazz? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Okay, so um, I may be the kazoo, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm Julie Cohen from Georgetown Law Center. I want to come back to the major theme of whether the data protection frameworks um, can completely get wrapped around. And I want to kind of take it into a minor key and suggest that there is a place um, at which the data protection framework may be just radically incomplete, and we didn't see it until this arose. Um, what is going on here is a problem that is only in part to do with the processing of personal data and in part to do with the way in which our artifacts are becoming opaque to us. Um, so it's not even a question of where you consent, but a question of how you would know what you are consenting to when you do not know what your artifacts do. Um, and that is the point at which we run headlong into another kind of data protection, which is the data protection of trade secrecy, which often steps in precisely to prevent you from being able to learn about how your artifacts are behaving, whether or not they're taking your data any place that you don't know about. Um, and if, uh, and I, I do think um, that this suggests that there is just a gap um, within existing regulatory frameworks on both sides of the ocean um, regarding the extent to which this has been seen to be a privacy problem um, and what exactly might be done about it. Uh, and I, I would like uh, to ask the panel um, to speak to that incompleteness, um, if you would. Who wants to take the first step? Could I ask a question back, Julie, to sure. you? Um, it, it, it sounds to me as if you're suggesting that the opacity results from some kind of proprietary control over uh, no. components or, okay, so, so, so what's, the, what's the origin of the opacity in sometimes your... Sometimes it results from proprietary control, but sometimes it simply results from the complex and dynamic environment. So that chair is an artifact. just the way that we learn to behave. Um, it is so complicated um, that you're not even aware uh, of what it is doing. Um, but should you then try to discover what it is doing, often that's where the proprietary frameworks come in. Um, and there is, there is, I think, a real conflict um, between um, uh, privacy in the sense of individual agency in the immediate physical environment um, and this complexity. I'm, I'm more tempted to, to, to come back to the proprietary part, if you don't mind, because I think that's an important part of it as well. I mean, I, I take it the part that's non-proprietary does link up to what I started with my opening segment in terms of affective computing. Sometimes it's not affective. Sometimes we don't know what's going on um, and nobody's doing anything about it. It's just the sheer complexity of the thing itself that constitutes whatever's going on in its environment. Um, but sometimes um, there have been careful design elements put in by certain people in place in order to have it constitute um, its use or whatever in a particular kind of way. And I'm interested in seeing uh, to the idea that oversight principles take into account those kinds of design principles. With respect to the proprietary issue, I guess in a way uh, and, and, and I take it you, you were suggesting this wasn't precisely where you were going with this, but it does come back to a broad theme that we have talked about in this community a fair bit, uh, which is the intersection between something like digital rights management, DRM, in a very broad sense, outside of a copyright context, um, and, um, and privacy. Uh, and and I, uh, I, I can only speak for my very limited knowledge of, of what is going on sort of behind the scenes in policy in Canada, but I can certainly say that I know that our federal commissioner has been very interested um, and paid close attention 
to uh, the ways in which some of these design choices that affect rights management in these kinds of ways um, implicate privacy. But as far as I know, to answer your question, nothing has been done um, other than the expression of concern uh, in terms of developing new regulatory principles to deal with those kinds of complexities. And let me propose potentially that this may be a good conversation over lunch. We actually have a lab at Intel that's dealing with exactly this issue around opaqueness and user experience to the degree that user experience is impacted by that opaqueness around sensor technology. So I, I, I particularly, let, let's follow up on this. Um, there's somebody who I took way out of order and I apologize. So let me go to the question right there. There's no problem at all. Auke Haagsma, I'm uh, with an organization called ICOMP, uh, Initiative for a Competitive Online Marketplace. We actually, I mean, this is becoming a fascinating discussion and we hear a lot about privacy by design. We're organizing a site event uh, tonight at uh, 6.30. Uh, at the hotel uh, down floor, you're all uh, invited. Um, my point was going to be, uh, if, if you have, in, in, in jazz, I mean, you sometimes have uh, a new wave of jazz, uh, and it often comes from people looking, taking some inspiration from outside of, of jazz. Sometimes um, it's really bad and needs to be done away with, too, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I won't comment on that one, absolutely. Don't um, insult Sun Ra. I, I, <laughs> um, but I'm going to do something which is very dangerous uh, in, in this audience. We're, we're, uh, and, and we heard uh, that you took inspiration from what's happening in other parts of the world, but it was still in, in privacy law. If you take another area of law, if you look at competition law, I, I, I heard Natasha say we shouldn't change the law constantly in order to try and keep up with technological developments because they will have moved on beyond us. If I look at competition law, uh, those laws go back to the 19th century and haven't changed uh, effectively. And they deal with very complex issues uh, and are able to do that. And how? By uh, staying with first, first principles. And then you get things like, uh, if, if you talk about uh, an issue such as a recommendation and saying it's not enforceable, in the competition area, that's exactly what they do. I mean, they have lots of informal documents. They give guidance, but you make them work because they are giving you guidance on how you interpret the first principles. Now, isn't that what we need when we talk about an area where there are such rapid technological developments? Shouldn't we move away from trying to make the law specific in legal provisions and be much more based on first principles and interpreting them through recommendations, guidance, etc., which is actually the, the discussion which in Europe, uh, and, and I'm very glad that justice now allows us to have a broad discussion about a new directive, but I think that's part of the discussion we, we should be having. You see vigorous nodding of yes, I'm going to have Professor Kerr respond, and then we'll go to Mr. Borking, and then we'll wrap up. Um, well, you know, I think that the notion of technological neutrality has gotten a lot of play, in particular in the privacy space, and I think in particular because the fair information practices have gone a long way and got a lot of mileage out of not having to revamp our principles all the time. But I do think it is worth leaving open the question that there are certain kinds of technologies for which the folk songs, uh, you know, to take it back to the previous metaphor, um, don't sing to that generation of technology and that in fact we actually need new principles. So while technological neutrality is an aspiration um, that we would want to seek in terms of information policy, I think we also have to recognize that not all technologies are neutral and therefore sometimes the politics uh, around particular technologies um, are of a sort that they might require refined thinking around their specificity uh, rather than the generalized one. I think it's a combination of both. I don't think I'm saying, you know, I don't like that talk about how everything is radically changed and nothing ever the, uh, from the past matters anymore. But I don't think that um, I'm concerned that these kinds of technologies that we're talking about are precisely the sort where using the notion of technological neutrality as a platitude is going to actually throw more risk our way um, than solve problems for us. I think we're going to have to be thinking about how to use those principles 
but also about whether these technologies require other kinds of considerations. C could I just uh, second the, the notion of looking to competition law as an example here? I think it's an outstanding point that we've had, certainly in the U.S., we've had some of the same basic uh, 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 statutory frameworks for a, a century. Uh, um, and what we have from both the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department are a series of merger guidelines, uh, competition guidelines. Whole, these are informal documents. Courts pay tremendous attention to those documents, and probably more importantly, the marketplace plays tremendous attention to those documents. They evolve over time. They're able to pick up special issues as they, as they arise. And I think it's and and they manage to scale to an entire national economy and beyond that. Uh, they are the basis, as you know, for cooperation, for example, between the United States and, and, and Europe on matters uh, uh, where, where the marketplace is in fact global, and I think it's an important example to draw inspiration from. So, so music often has to come back to where it started to satisfactorily resolve ourselves. So we come back to Mr. Borking, who was our first inter intervention, intervention, to wrap us up. I'm sorry to keep we you from your lunch, but just a final note. Um, what I was wondering is um, uh, whether the individuals that are confronted with the Internet of Things are in fact defenseless. Is there no research that provi can provide the individual a technological mean to protect itself? I have some experience with uh, the work of mobile uh, software agents that can manage your own privacy. I, it was, the whole thing was triggered earlier by the fact that the consent mechanism is very complicated and old-fashioned. But if you use, for example, mobile software agents, you can be uh, very quick in giving your consent still within a controlled environment. A excellent point. Excellent point about the, how innovation can help. Natasha, do you want to wrap us up? Yeah. It's, it's really it's a nice remark to end our discussion. We have to be aware that we are talking about the individuals. Talking about Internet of Things is not talking about different gadgets, it's talking about individuals. And talking about individuals' consent, we have to be aware that in the data protection world there are only two legal grounds. One is the legislation, the other one is consent of an individual uh, to process personal data. But we have to be aware that informed consent of an individual should be in the focus. But just to end this marvelous round table and the discussion, I would like to say that we need the discussions, we need to communicate, and I would just like to uh, end this round table with one famous sentence that Martin Luther King Jr. said, uh, our lives will end the day when we become silent about the things that matter. So let's keep on discussing things and don't forget about the individuals. At the end, we are all part of this big world, but part as being an individual and we have to respect the individual's rights. So thank you, and I hope you did enjoy this panel. Have to see you soon.